mainly on the limited partnership. Um, we'll also go into detail and talk about how the limited partnership you know, can protect your liquid assets uh, and also how the limited partnership can also uh, act as a, a second layer of protection uh, for other business entities that you own. And, and both of these will make sense to you later in the presentation. We'll go into both of them in detail. Um, we'll also talk about the uh, taxation considerations uh, in regards to a limited partnership as well. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel the, free to email them to info at assetprotectionattorneys.com. And uh, at the end, uh, we will go through the Q&A portion uh, of the webinar. Um, so what is asset protection? My definition of asset protection is that it's the legal process of titling one's personal and business assets uh, to put them beyond the reach of future potential threats and creditors while simultaneously enjoying those assets. So again, I know that's a long definition, but my definition of asset protection is the legal process of titling one's assets to put them beyond the reach of future potential threats and creditors while simultaneously enjoying the benefit of those assets. And the first question we usually get is, do I have enough assets to protect? Uh, and the simple answer is yes. Uh, the smaller amount of assets you have, the more important asset protection comes. Uh, and the example I always like to give is we represent a lot of professional athletes and celebrities. Uh, they're not the majority of our clients, but we just happen to have a lot of them. Uh, most of our clients are lawyers, doctors, business owners, financial advisors, really anybody who wants to protect what they've worked so hard to obtain. And the example I always like to give is take one of my professional football players who signs a contract for $30 million. Well, if that football player is sued for $5 million, He's certainly not going to be happy, but he still has $25 million left. You know, contrast that with a uh, regular person who has maybe saved up a couple hundred thousand dollars over their lifetime. You know, if they're sued for a million dollars, uh, they're going to be wiped out, and it's going to be very difficult, uh, if not impossible, for them to recover from that. So I say the less you have, the more you need protection. Now, certainly the small guy doesn't need the same plan as the big guy, but certainly needs some sort of plan. And a lot of people say, well, what if I already have a plan? You know, every single year laws change, uh, and you need to make sure that your plan is always updated on a yearly basis. And, and I'm not necessarily saying there will always be changes every year, but, it, but it's something you at least want to consider and have reviewed. So I recommend to all my clients that, you know, once a year, just like you go for a physical or a medical checkup, uh, I recommend you go for a financial checkup and uh, just have someone review your plan, uh, make sure it's up to date, has all the right asset protection clauses, all the right anti-creditor clauses, because again, laws change in this field. So a lot of people say, well, why do I need asset protection? And you'll see I always like this cartoon that I've been using lately. It's uh, two lawyers talking, and one saying, I say sue, and the other one saying, anyone in particular. And a lot of people usually laugh when uh, they see this, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, this is the truth. You know, just like we're getting together to educate ourselves and talk about ways that we can protect ourselves, well, the lawyers get together and talk about who can we sue next. Is it going to be the business owners, the car manufacturers, the drug manufacturers? You know, who can they sue? Uh, there's over 100 million lawsuits every single year, and that number is only growing. Uh, in today's terrible economy, a lot of people are losing their jobs. Uh, the people who are lucky enough to keep a job are, are making less and less. Uh, the issue we have there is that there's so many attorneys and so many attorneys that will take your case for free on a contingency basis. So uh, this person can go to any lawyer, get their case taken for free, doesn't have to spend a penny, only cost them a couple hours of time, and if they win, they get thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, a lot of times tax-free money. Uh, there's a one in four, I, I, I keep meaning to update my presentation, but uh, there's a one in three chance that you'll be sued in the next 12 months. So one out of every three people will be sued next year. Uh, the average person and company is sued about five times over their lifetime. So uh, if you're an individual, on average, you can be sued about five times over your lifetime. If you own a business, that's ten times, five for you, five for the business. Now, I have clients that have never been sued, and I have clients that are sued literally dozens of times on a monthly basis. So these are just the normal stats. Uh, there's a 50% chance of divorce, and a lawsuit can cost you tens of thousands of dollars even if you win the case. Uh, unfortunately, the United States has made it so easy and cheap, if not free, 
uh, for anybody to bring a case in the legal system, but it makes it so costly to defend one. You know, there's so many lawyers out there that you can get to take your case for free because uh, they will take a percentage of the winnings if they win the case. But in order to defend your case, you're going to have to hire an attorney. So even if you win your case, there's a chance that you're still a loser because if you've spent tens of thousands of dollars on attorney's fees, even if you win, you've still lost. And I tell people the trick isn't making money, it's keeping it. You know, it's a lot easier to make the money than it is to keep it. And the challenge that I give to all of my clients is that for every 60 minutes you spend making money, spend 60 seconds thinking about how to protect it. Well, a lot of people say, well, what about liability insurance? You know, isn't that enough? Uh, and my answer is uh, I don't sell insurance, but uh, I'm a big fan, uh, and I tell my clients to buy as much insurance as possible because it's cheap and it helps you sleep at night. Uh, but at the end of the day, understand that, uh, you know, the insurance companies are the only ones who have their names on the big buildings. Uh, you know, they are for-profit companies. They're not there to pay all your claims. If they paid all your claims, they would go out of business. So while I think it's great to have insurance, uh, you can't solely rely on it. Seventy percent of lawsuits are not covered by insurance. Uh, you know, my father always used to say, the big print giveth, the small print taketh away. Uh, anybody who has an insurance policy knows there's about a half a page of things that are included and about 60 pages of exclusions. So there's a good chance that your insurance won't cover what the lawsuit is. Uh, your coverage may be inadequate. You know, you might have $250,000 in coverage, but if you're being sued for a million bucks, who do you think has to come out of pocket the other seven fifty? Your insurance company might go bankrupt. Now, if I would have said that years ago, you guys would have laughed me out of the room, but today we have big banks going out of business, Fortune 500 companies going out of business. Who's to say that the uh, insurance companies won't be next? And insurance doesn't uh, cover other uninsured financial risks and divorce. Actually, there is a, uh, a company now, who knows what will be next, that actually offers divorce insurance. So I found that uh, pretty uh, funny. Uh, my point is that insurance alone is not the answer. You know, you need your own asset protection plan to supplement your insurance. I call it the belt and suspenders approach. Three maxims of asset protection planning. Number one, protect yourself before you have a problem. You know, I can't stress this enough. Asset protection is meant to be proactive. You know, you don't buy health insurance after you get sick. You don't buy car insurance if there's an accident. Make sure you put your asset protection plan in place before something happens. Start with a basic plan. Add firewalls as needed. Um, a lot of people have read the books that we wrote on asset protection and will come to us and say they need an international offshore asset protection trust. And a lot of times they don't, and I'll have to spend an hour kind of unselling them on why they don't need it. Um, you know, start with a very basic plan. Start with an inexpensive plan. Start with a simple plan. You know, as your assets grow, your plan can grow. As your education grows, your plan can grow. But there's no point in putting some difficult, expensive plan into place if you're not going to utilize it correctly. And most importantly, don't look for one magic bullet. Uh, you know, asset protection is not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, everybody's potential uh, assets are different. Everybody's potential threats and creditors are different. So it might work for you, might not work for me, and vice versa. So make sure you have a customized and individualized plan for yourself. Five killer mistakes to avoid. Number one is hiding your assets. Asset protection is not about hiding. It's not about secrecy. It's about protection. Uh, with a good asset protection plan, you should be able to tell anyone and everyone where your assets are. They just shouldn't be able to get to them. Now, I'm not telling you to go stand on the top of a mountain and tell everybody and shout you know, what you have and where it is. But again, you have to understand that uh, in asset protection, you should put the plan in place assuming that one day you'll be deposed under oath. One day you'll have to fill out a financial affidavit under oath, and you never want to perjure yourself. So again, don't hide your assets. Protect them. Number two, don't title your assets to straws. So many people come in my office and say, oh, don't worry, Mr. Presser, I'm being sued, but I've given everything to my best friend or my brother-in-law. Well, what would actually make you think that your best friend or your brother-in-law have less financial problems than you? You know, if they're sued, uh, the creditors of them could take your assets. If they're divorced, the spouses of them could take your assets. So don't ever go title your assets to straws. Titling your assets to your spouse. We see this the most with our doctor and physician clients. They'll title their assets to their spouse because they think they might have less liability. 
here's the thing. You know, nobody's immune from a lawsuit. Nobody gets up in the morning and expects to be sued. Uh, the wife could just as easily be uh, sued for getting in a car accident while taking the kids to soccer practice. So don't go titling all your assets to your spouse. Uh, you never want to commit any fraudulent transfers. Uh, a fraudulent transfer is when you have a present or potential lawsuit. You transfer assets out of your name for less than fair market value, and as a result, the creditor doesn't get paid. So, for example, you're being sued for $100,000, and you have 200000 in assets. You take the 200000 and give it to your brother. Your brother gives you nothing in return, no car, no boat, no plane, no condo, no services. That is a clear and cut fraudulent transfer. You are being sued for 100000 you took the 200000 that was in your name, transferred it out of your name to your brother, got nothing in return of fair market value, and as a result, the creditor doesn't get paid. Uh, that is a clear and cut fraudulent transfer, and you want to avoid it at all costs because it could essentially defunct the rest of your plan, which otherwise might have been protective. And of course, you never want to break any laws. Uh, we do both domestic and international offshore asset protection. Uh, there's nothing wrong with doing offshore asset protection. There's something very wrong with doing it and uh, not reporting it to the IRS. So anytime you have any domestic or international asset protection, you always want to make sure that you fill out all the proper reporting requirements with the IRS, the Treasury Department, etc. Always make sure that uh, you know, you're doing things legally and ethically. So partnership basics, you know, what is the definition of a partnership? And there's a lot of different definitions, um, but uh, one definition is uh, a legal contract entered into by two or more parties in which each one agrees to furnish either a part of the capital or labor and services uh, for the business by which each share shares a fixed proportion of profits and losses. So I'll repeat that because I know it's long. Uh, it's a legal contract entered into by you know, at least uh, two people uh, in which each one agrees to furnish a, a certain part of the capital uh, and or potentially uh, the labor and services for the business and by which they each share in a fixed proportion of profits and losses. It's really just a contractual relationship between two or more people you know, carrying on a joint business venture with a view to profit, each one incurring liability for losses and the right to share in the profits, of course. Uh, how a partnership is formed and how it differs from other business entities just depends what type of partnership it is. Uh, with a general partnership, it can be formed literally with just a handshake. Um, it's really just uh, the mutual uh, consent and asset of the two parties uh, to enter into business together. You know, this obviously differs from other entities because there are no formal requirements to file anything. Uh, with a limited partnership that we'll talk about today, it's more similar to the other business entities and, and, and there are filing requirements. Um, there's a lot of different types of partnerships. There's the general partnership, the limited partnership, family limited partnership, the limited liability partnership. God, I can go on and on. Uh, today we're going to focus on the limited partnership. And the partnership agreement, um, essentially they're just written documents that explicitly detail the relationship between the business partners and their individual obligation. They're not required, uh, but they're definitely essentially to have, essential to have, and we're going to talk about that a little later on. Bear with me, I'm just uh, trying to get to the next slide. So how do you form a limited partnership? Essentially, in a limited partnership, there's two partners. And I like to draw my limited partnership like a house. So you have the square on the bottom and the triangle roof. Uh, there's two partners in a limited partnership. You have the general partner, which is the top of the roof and the limited partner, which is the bottom of the roof, it always owns the minority, usually anywhere from about 1 to 9%. And the limited partner always owns the majority, usually from about 90 to 99%. Uh, the percentages just vary based on estate planning. Uh, but just to kind of recap, I draw the limited partnership like a house, a square on the bottom with a triangle roof. Uh, there's two partners. There's the general partner and the limited partner. Uh, the general partner is the top of the house, the triangle roof and the limited partner is the bottom of the house, the square foundation. General partner usually owns the minority, 1 to 9%, depending on estate planning. And the limited partner usually owns the majority, uh, 90 to 99%, uh, just depending on estate planning. Um, and here's the interesting thing. Uh, unlike in a corporation where if you own 51%, you're the decision maker, that's not the case in a limited partnership. In a limited partnership, it doesn't matter how much a limited partner owns. They can own 
It doesn't matter how little a general partner owns, they can own 1%. The general partner is the only one who can make any decisions regarding the partnership. So let's give an example. Uh, if uh, me and John own a limited partnership together, and uh, John is the 1% general partner, and I'm the 99% limited partner, and there's a million dollars in there, well, technically, I'm entitled, I legally and ethically own 99% of that million dollars. So I own $990,000. Uh, legally and ethically, John only owns 1% of that million dollars, which is 10%. However, since I'm the limited partner and John's the general partner, I have absolutely no say. I cannot get any distributions. I can't touch a penny unless John says so because only the general partner has any control over the assets of the partnership. With this being said, with great power comes great responsibility. So what you guys might be thinking now is that you want to be the general partner. Well, I never like a client to individually be the general partner because with great res power comes great responsibility, and general partner is 100% personally liable for any debts, obligations uh, of the business. So what I always like to do, um, especially if money is not an issue, is create another company, uh, whether it's a trust, a corporation, uh, LLC, uh, to act as the general partner. And uh, of course, you can own and control that company. So indirectly, you can be the general partner, and indirectly, you can make all the decisions, but you never want to personally be the general partner because then you have uh, unlimited uh, exposure to personal liability. So a lot of people want to know, how does the limited partnership protect your liquid assets? And the limited partnership is actually the most protective entity you can have in the entire United States to protect your liquid assets. There is nothing stronger in the United States that you can do uh, rather than a limited partnership to protect your personal assets. The reason being is that if you have your assets in your personal name and you're sued, well, they can take it, they can freeze your bank account. If you have your liquid assets tied up to a limited partnership, it's not in your name. So just like you and I are separate people, you and your limited partnership are separate people. Well, you, have, you and I have different social security numbers. You and your limited partnership will have different socials and tax IDs. So if you're sued and you have $100,000 in your personal account, they could take it. If you're sued and you have $100,000 in your limited partnership, they cannot take it. Uh, if they beat you in a case and they depose you under oath or give you a financial affidavit, we talked about this earlier, asset protection is not about hiding or secrecy, it's about protection. And of course, if asked under oath, you'll tell them that you have money in a limited partnership. However, they have no rights to inspect the books of the limited partnership. They cannot force a distribution. Uh, they can't interfere with the business. They can't do anything to get to those liquid assets except one thing. Uh, the creditor can get what's called a charging order. And essentially a ch what a charging order states is that if a distribution is taken from the partnership to the debtor, well, then the creditor can stand in the debtor's shoes and take the money. It pretty much makes sense. If your money's in a limited partnership and you're sued personally, they can't get to the money unless the distribution is made from the limited partnership to you. So while the money's in the company, they can't touch it. When the money comes to you, they can touch it. Common sense. With that being said, who's going to make the decision if the money comes to you? Well, we talked about this earlier in the limited partnership. The general partner will make the decision on if the money comes to you. Who's the general partner? Partner? It's some company that you own and control. So obviously you're not going to make any distributions when you have a creditor there. That way they can never get to your money. Um, also, uh, you can get to your money. There's a lot of different ways you could take the money out. You could potentially take it out as a loan or a wage, uh, which is not affected by a charging order. Uh, you might even have the limited partnership, you know, uh, create a new uh, company like an LLC, transfer the money from the limited partnership to the LLC, and pay all your bills from there. You know, that way it never even goes to your personal name. Uh, a lot of different variations of what you can do, but the point is, is that your liquid assets can be protected by using a limited partnership. The limited partnership can also be used as a second layer of protection. Um, for example, let's say you owned a business. Let's say you owned real estate. Let's say you owned a boat. You never want to own any of those in your personal name. Number one, because if you're sued personally, somebody can take it. Number two is if there's ever an accident with the boat, if anybody slips and falls on the property, they're allowed to sue the owner, and you don't want them suing you as the owner. So anytime you have one of those assets, you always want them in a protective company uh, like an LLC or a corporation, uh, just some sort of protective entity. Well, the limited partnership can not only hold your liquid assets, however, they wouldn't own the real estate or the boat or the business directly. However, if the real estate or the business or the boat were in an LLC, 
the limited partnership can own the membership interest in the LLC, or if the boat or business or real estate was in a corporation, the limited partnership could potentially own the shares in the corporation. Now those other assets have two layers of protection. So the first layer of protection is I don't own the boat, it's owned by the LLC. I don't own the business, it's owned by the LLC. I don't own the real estate, it's owned by the LLC. And the second layer is I don't even own the LLC, it's owned by the limited partnership. So the limited partnership is not only good to protect your liquid assets, it's also great to act as a second layer of protection for any other business entities that you own, you know, mainly corporations and uh, LLCs. Uh, a lot of people ask why the limited partnership is so protective, and it, and it really goes back to a few things. Uh, number one, the limited partnership is the most protective entity you can have inside the United States, and that's because it's been tested. Uh, there's been a lot of case law, a lot of court cases where the limited partnership has been challenged, so we have a really good idea of what it'll protect, how it'll protect it, and, and how it will or will not. Um, so we have all the support, uh, years and years of, of court documentation. But the way it really gets its strength is, number one, you have to set it up in the right jurisdiction. You know, some states are better than others to set up the limited partnership. So number one, you want to pick the right jurisdiction. Number two is you want to set it up correctly. When I say correctly, there's different states you can set up a limited partnership where it's totally anonymous, which means no one will even know this exists. Now, when I say no one, of course, uh, the attorney who helps you set it up will know. You will know. Of course, the IRS will know because, of course, you'll get a uh, tax ID number, but no potential creditors will know. But the way the limited partnership gets the most strength is through its partnership agreement. Uh, you really need to have an individualized and customized tailored partnership agreement for the limited partnership with all the asset protection and anti-creditor clauses. And when we draft them, they're, they're tailored. Sometimes they're 20 pages, sometimes 40, sometimes 60. But depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you always want to make sure that you, know, you put as uh, much uh, protective clauses in there. They're beneficial to you as the debtor and uh, not beneficial uh, to the creditor. And uh, just bear with me. I'm just getting to the next slide. Taxation. Um, limited partnerships, the great thing about them are that they're tax neutral. That means you're not going to pay any more in taxes. You're not going to pay any less in taxes. Okay? So uh, let me give you an example. Uh, let's say you have $500,000 inside your limited partnership, and you have a great financial advisor, and at the end of the year you have $600,000. You have $100,000. Even if you don't take the money out, any of the money, so now you have $600,000 sitting there, even if you take none of the money out, you're still responsible for taxes on the $100,000 gain. So that $100,000 gain would, would pass through uh, potentially uh, to your personal tax return. It just depends on how it's set up. But the point is, is you're not going to pay any more in taxes. You're not going to pay any less in taxes. It's all tax neutral. Uh, also, uh, there could be a potential uh, negative for the creditor. Uh, we call this a, a poison pill. Uh, if a creditor gets a charging order against you for $300,000, well, we know he can't get the money that's in the limit partnership unless there's a distribution. We know that there's never going to be a distribution because the general partner, which is a company which you own and control, is never going to make that distribution. Uh, you'll never make that. The creditor is still responsible to pay the taxes on the money that he's entitled to. So when we, when we had that example where there was 500000 there and then we made another 100000 to equal 600000 even if no money was taken out, you would be responsible for paying the taxes on the $100,000, probably a cap, at a cap gain rate. No difference for the creditor. So if a creditor has a charging order against you for $100,000, even though they don't receive the $100,000, there's still a very good chance uh, that they're going to have to pay the taxes on the money that they'll never receive. You know, it just puts the client in a, in a really good bargaining position. You know, the whole point of asset protection is if it's a frivolous lawsuit, you know, you don't want to pay anything. Uh, if it's a legitimate claim, you know, if you can settle for five, ten cents on the dollar, then we feel like we've done our job correctly. 